bless you. We, we, are, we are so happy and so pleased to share with you a, a very good lesson today. And it's good because of times like we, we are going through now. Uh, the, the subject is the rich fool. Uh, not the rich young ruler, but the rich fool. Now, the Bible calls him a fool. Him that teaches, uses the parable, calls him that. Jesus himself calls him that. So, so I'm, I'm, I'm conscious of what the Bible says to, says for us not to do. That we ought to not call nobody a fool. But the Bible calls this man a fool. A rich fool. From the book of Luke chapter 12, I've got to read this to you for you to get an understanding of what we're talking about. And I promise you that uh, we, we won't hold you too long. We just want to share this blessing with you and uh, how good God has been to us. First of all, let us pray. Gracious Master, we come in the name of Jesus Christ. We thank you for opportunity to teach the word of God, and we pray for the blessings as Bishop Morton was singing, let it rain, so he's singing about your spirit. So we ask you, Lord, let your spirit flow within us. Lord, we'll thank you again for our media ministry for Brother King, that you would continue to bless him, and bless us, Lord, in this church. In the name of Jesus Christ, we say amen. The rich fool. Jesus, in verse 13, chapter 12, verse 13 to 20. Before you read 13, read 12. For the Holy Ghost shall teach you in the same hour what you ought to say. He just said that to his disciples. And right after he said that, watch what happened. And one of the company said unto him, Master, speak to my brother that he divide the inheritance with me. Watch what Jesus says. And he said unto him, Man, who made me a judge or a divider over you? And he said unto them, and here come the teaching part, Take heed and beware of covenants. You know what covenants is? When you cover things that are not yours or want things badly that you would do things that you should not do. Uh, for a man's life consists not in the abundance of things which he possess. And then he spoke a parable unto them, uh, uh, an earthly story with heavenly meaning. The ground of a certain rich man brought forth plentiful, and he thought within himself, saying, what shall I do? Because I have no room where to bestow my fruits. Got rich and got confused. Because <laughs> uh, he asked a question, what should I do? And he said, this is what I will do. Then his mind click. I will pull down my bones and build a greater bone. There will I bestow all my fruits and all my goods. And I will say to my soul, talking to himself, so... Thou have much good lay up for many years. Take thy ease. Eat, drink, and be merry. But God said unto him, now God spoke to him. Thou fool. God called him a fool. This night thou soul shall be, shall be required of thee. That means he's going to die. And, 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 and then whose things shall this things, these things be which thou hast provided? So, 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 so is he, that's what Jesus says, so is he that lay up treasures for himself and is not rich toward God. The writer puts this, life is not measured. It is not measured by how much you possess, 
but by what you do with your stuff. That's what he says. He said he has a friend whose uh, husband is a missionary, and she's been working with him in the mission field in Brazil for 30 years. She grew up on a ranch that her father owned, large ranch in Montana. And when, his, when her father died, he wanted his children to inherit that ranch. But he, her brother, she had one brother and a sister, her brother's wife decided that she wanted all of it for her and her children. And she, she decided that they was going to have to, her brother said, no, I'm going to keep all of it. They both worked on the ranch, grew up on the ranch, and worked on the ranch. But her brother said, no, I'm going to keep all of it because of what his wife wanted. But she, they had to go to court. She decided that she's not going to go to court. She's not going to fight with her brother for the property. She gave it all up and went back into the mission field. The writer says she was not foolish and knew that honoring and serving God was far more important than material possession. She decided to go in the mission field, let her brother have the property, because she could have had part of it, and she was going to have to stay there in order to take care of the property. But she decided, I'm, let him have it. I'm going back into the mission field and do the work of the Lord. And, 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 uh, but Jesus... When he was talking to, after talking to his disciples, there was a man in the crowd, and there was a lot of people around him. And one of them asked him, Master, tell my brother to give me my part of the inheritance that our father have left for us. And Jesus responded to him, because it was customary that a, a, a legal dispute can be settled by a rabbi by a rabbi. So that's what the man asked him. Jesus was considered a teacher, a rabbi. Instead of honoring the man's request, Jesus gives a warning about the danger of covenants. Luke, who is the writer of the book of Luke and the book of Acts, he was a physician. He was un undoubtedly very affluent. But he knew the danger of greed. He had money. He had resources, and, 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 and notice what he did with, with his resources. We know from the book of Acts that he was a traveling companion of the Apostle Paul. And it's reasonable for us to assume that he sometimes uses his personal resources. Amen? Remember, he's affluent now. He was a physician. His personal resources to support the missionary work, he was in the work, and he had resources, money, and so since he was in the work, not only did he do the work, but he supported the work of the ministry. Simply what it means, he gave money to, 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 the, uh, to the ministry. Luke, uh, uh, whether, whether, whether this is the case or not, in the gospel, Luke repeatedly condemns the selfish accumulation, accumulation, accumulation of personal wealth. The parable of the rich fool is a classical example. Simply put, don't be a fool. Jesus tells the story of a farmer who had, who had an unexpected and incredibly large harvest that would make him very rich. He said it himself. Plentiful, the Bible calls it, and the word is very rich. It was so abundant that he didn't have room in his bones to store up all the grains that he had. It is unlikely that today that farmers could get rich, then get a good living, make a good living farming, but if they invest their money in technology, Microsoft, Apple, first Facebook, Amazon, many others, technology, technological companies, can, you can get rich that way. The accumulation of wealth is not inherently evil. I want to make that clear. Nothing wrong with getting rich. In both the Old and the New Testament, there were wealthy men and women are honored 
for their faith and their generosity. Amen. Not only did they have faith, but they were givers. Abraham, Deborah, Deborah Solomon, Barnabas, Lydia. What the Bible condemns is not getting rich, but the Bible condemns greed. Paul warns about the danger of lust for money. In the new literal translation, not the King James Version, but the new literal translation of 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 9 to 10. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 9 to 10. Paul says this. Paul says those who want to get rich falls into a, 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 a temptation and into a trap and into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin, ruin and destruction. For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. That's what he said. Some people eager for money have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs and sorrow. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 9 to 10. The rich fool should have heed those kind of warning. Maybe he lived before Paul, but he was told about that before. Listen to me. To store his abundant harvest, the farmer tore down his old bones and built bigger ones. Instead of using his wealth to advance the kingdom of God, he made plans for total self-indulgent lifestyle. Amen? A self-indulgent lifestyle. It's all about me, myself, and I. The repeat, repeated use of the pronoun, pronoun I, exposes his obsession with himself. I, my riches, mm, my phone, my plentifulness, my bone, my life. And watch what he says. He did not speak to no one else. He spoke to himself. The Bible says, he said to his soul, soul, take your rest. Eat, drink, and be merry. His selfishness. Luke 12 and 19. The problem wasn't his unexpected wealth, but his godless intention, his G-O-D-L-E-S. It was not his wealth, but it was his godless intention. He completely excluded God from the plan. Don't need him. Don't want him. Mine, me, myself, and I. Modern day investors, the counselors, would have agreed with this man's decision to, to, to use his wealth to take care of his self indulgence, indulgent lifestyle. They would agree with that. But not God, but not God. He said, you fool. That's what a new literal translation of Luke 12 and 20. You will die this very night. Then who will get everything you have worked for? While I was studying, saying, reading that, I want you to understand something. God didn't kill him. God told him that that's when he's going to die. Told him, man, you're going to die tonight. Now what you going to do? What's going to happen to everything that you work for? Who will have what you work for? I, I got a, uh, some, used to be neighbor. Uh, uh, I think they, they passed away. He had both of them. But they said to me one time that, man, we're going to spend everything we got so that our children will not have nothing to fight over. I don't know if they did that or not, but that's what they told me. That's what he told me they were going to do. The man either forgot or ignored the wisdom of his ancestors who believed that the enjoyment of life was a gift from God. 
That's what his ancestors, remember what I told you. He might have lived before the apostle Paul wrote the, his words, but, his, but he knew better because his ancestors passed on to him the fact, the fact of life is that the enjoyment of life comes from God. Look to the hill from which cometh your help. All of my help comes from the Lord. God owes, owns, O-W-N, owns everything. To everything belongs to him. He made it and it belongs to him. Even we ourselves belong to the Lord. The writer of Ecclesiastic observed this again in Ecclesiastes chapter 2, verse 24 and 25. Ecclesiastes chapter 2, verses 24 and 25. The writer of Ecclesiastes says this, so I decided there is nothing better than to enjoy food and drink and to find satisfaction in my work. Then he said, then I realized these pleasures are from the hand of God. For who can enjoy anything apart from God? Ecclesiastes chapter 2, verses 24 and 25. He says it's a good thing. It's a good thing, he said. I didn't find nothing better than to enjoy food and drink. We just come through Thanksgiving. Nothing better to enjoy family, food, and drink. But you must realize that it comes from God. He said all at once, he said, wait a minute. All of this pleasure is from the hand of God. For who can enjoy any of this from God, apart from God? Jesus explained the point of the story when he said, yes, a person is a fool to store up earthly wealth but not have a rich relationship with God. I heard one speaker explain that way with a bit of humor. You can't take it with you. I never seen a hearse pulling a U-Haul. He was right. Paul advised the rich, his advice to the rich, it's also an app, a real commentary on this parable. Again, in the new, in the NLT, the new literal, literal translation, 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 17 to 19. Let me repeat it. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 17 to 19. Uh, Paul gives a commentary on that parable. Listen to what Paul said. Teach those who are rich in this world. Not to be proud, not to trust in their money, which is unreliable. Their trust should be in God who richly gives us all we need for our enjoyment. Tell them to use their money to do good. They should be rich in good works. That's what Paul says. And generous to those in need. Always being ready to share with others. By doing this, they will be storing up their treasure as a good foundation for the future so that they may experience a true life in future. Let me, let me tell you two, uh, two things. It certainly uh, uh, reminds me of the owner of the saints and the pelicans. She, she says that she's going to sell it. And then she's going to take all the money and give it to charity. And what she said was, I can't take it with me anyhow. So that is her intention to take that says I can't take it, but I have within a, having a spiritual heart, I will give it where it can do good to help other people. She is she has a relationship with God, first of all. Secondly, she's building up treasure for what's gonna happen. When time comes to the end where she can spend eternity with the Lord, she's building up treasures up in heaven. It is good to do that, whether rich or poor, to build treasures up in heaven. It, as I come to a close, it really isn't about money. 
I think we would all agree that we should use our resources to advance the kingdom of God and not squander it them on selfish pleasure. Let me say this, y'all, as a pastor, and that's a, so, as an, an, a, an experience of life. I believe God will give you enough, on, not enough just to satisfy your life, but he'll give you more than enough to satisfy your life. And you can set yourself up for the future and still have more. And what will you do with that more? God bless you so that you can bless others. But, but, but what about saving for unexpected emergency and retirement? Would you, would you agree with uh, Mr. Bloomberg? Mr. Bloomberg, who seems to argue against accumulating wealth for emergency and retirement. But Mr. Bloomberg quotes John Purity, who contends that we should only work hard enough to provide for the necessity of life and leave the future in God's hand. That sounds good. That is good. But I agree, as the writer says, I agree somewhat with Mr. Bloomberg and Mr. Purity, but I also see a, a, a tension between merely working for the necessity of life and the accumulation of wealth. Wealthy people can be generous. Amen? They can give generous contribution to the work of kingdom. They are doing that. But poor people can't. It is significant that in 1 Timothy 6, 17, and 19, Paul does not condemn the rich but urges them to use their wealth to help those in need. I think the issue is ultimately, ultimately a matter of motive. I'm a, a close. It's not all about money, but it is mostly about what is your motive or your intention. That man had a selfish motive. He could have kept those bones fill them up and still have enough and more and took the rest of it and either in, he could have split it into investment and he could have given the rest to the people around him. What about his workers? What about bonuses to keep his good workers? Amen? To keep the people all quitting their jobs nowadays and going to work for themselves to own their own business and the business is left into a flux. But if you treat your workers right, and bless them, they will also bless you in return. God promised you that. And I, I, I thank God I, I, I looks and I know how people give in this church. Because as pastor, I, I see that. I have to see that. And there are many in my church who got resources, who are constantly and consistently in their giving, and um, the amount is large, and they, get, they bless this church, bless this pastor. And his wife, they are doing that, and God is taking care of them. I got up this morning, my word was, bless them. Because the Bible says that them that gives a profit reward shall receive a profit reward. And the Bible says if you give, that God will, will, will take it and stir it up and pour it out back to you where you will not have room to receive. This is really about not about giving to the church, not about giving to the poor. This is about your motive toward God and your relationship with God. If you got a good relationship with God, you don't have to be concerned about your giving because just in verse 12, and the Holy Ghost will tell you not only what to say, but what to do. Amen? So I say to you, uh, uh, God bless you. What a wonderful lesson it is. Continue to read that lesson uh, uh, again. And, and remember, God will provide for you. You don't have to be greedy. You don't have to be greedy. Be careful how you handle money. Amen? And do not count God out. Please, sir. Please, ma'am. I say good evening to you. May God bless you. May God keep you. Uh, uh, this is my prayer for you, and I'll say it again. I love you. 
with the love of God. Amen, amen, and amen.